All right, everybody, welcome. I am glad that you are here. And so what I'm going to be talking about today is I'm going to take a few minutes and I'm just going to talk about serial killers because people like serial killers. Well, I don't mean they like them personally, but they, um, they're interested in them. They, they're curious, kind of like we're curious about snakes or other lions or other predatory animals. Um, and so they're, they're fascinating. They're curious. We, they're far outside of the human, the normal or average human experience where we treat other people with gentleness and love and affection. And <clears throat> people think of serial killers or psychopaths as being um, intentional and consumed by power and control. So I thought I would talk a little bit about serial killers and what makes them tick. All right. So um, a serial killer is a serial killer is um, sorry, I'm going to be getting distracted by met by uh, messages and telephone stuff. So sorry about that. Um, so because serial killers generally, well, they're fearsome because you get this, uh, you get this idea that they're plotting their next victim and you might actually end up being the next victim that somehow they're stalking their prey, you know, through the dark streets or, or even watching you on YouTube and, you know, plotting their revenge upon you, I suppose. So without a doubt, the monstrous actions, the, the apparent lack of remorse for the crimes that they commit, um, they make us think more of predatory animals than human beings. They may look to be human beings on the surface, but below that exterior, that's where, you know, we part ways. Um, so FBI, some of the research has said, you know, that serial killers really have no awareness for the consequences of what they're doing, that the primary goal for, for their behaviors and their motivations, that their primary goal is really simple. They're just trying to indulge their sadistic drive. Um, I've often used the, uh, the analogy of a shark or a lion, um, you know, a lion, if he's hungry, he eats. If he wants sex, he has sex. If he's thirsty, he gets a drink of water. And above and beyond that, it's not really much more that lions do. And the same thing for, and now the female lines are a little different, but, but for a shark, it's the same exact thing. They just swim mindlessly through the water. And if they encounter food, then they will eat. And if they uh, encounter a female shark, then they do what they do. So, so it's really little more than that. But I think once you get into the research on serial killers, their drives, personality factors, motivations, um, they're really driven by that sad sadistic element. And you've heard me talk about the importance of the sadistic element. Um, I've, I've seen a lot of YouTubers talking about the, um, the dark triad in an effort to understand some of the criminal element that we've talked about um, because that was originally the dark triad was originally the, uh, the uh, factor, the variables, the individual variables that were used in that research, but they were missing out on a certain, um, a certain group in each sample that wasn't getting picked up by the triad and so eventually they came to say, wait a minute, we're forgetting a part. We're forgetting the people that just enjoy hurting. 
we we're forgetting that there are there's a subgroup of people here that when they're causing pain to another person they like it how we get we got to include them in the dark triad if we're going to get this full picture of you know the psychopathic deviant if you will okay so um so that's they added sadist us uh, as a variable the elements of sadism was added and that gave birth to the dark tetrad so those of you that have learned about the dark triad i would redirect you to information about the tetrad it is more um contemporary and more inclusive uh to address and talk about actual criminal behavior all right so um, serial killers uh, all have unique reasons for doing what they do. And many of them, many of the things that they do are not relatable for the typical non-criminal, non-sadistic human being. It's hard for us to understand and draw a parallel to what drives them. But when you recognize that these are people that are primarily being driven by an innate, aggressive um, personality, that they delight in having control over others and that they use uh, violent acts to control others, it can actually give them a sexual charge to use violence and uh, sadistic control. If, if you recognize that, then you it's easy to throw your hands up in there and say, wait a minute, why am I trying to get inside this guy or this woman's head to try to understand why they did this terrible sadistic thing? I don't have any parallels to what makes them tick. I'm nothing like them, so I can't understand them. So, so the predators that we consider a serial killer a predator um, or anybody that's being driven by sadistic power needs, they are predators. And as such, they're considered to be hunting. They're hunting. They're looking for a victim um, on which they can act out their control fantasies and, you know, calm their bloodlust for a short period of time. And so they take exquisite pleasure in watching, choosing the next victim, uh, following them, recording the, the things they're doing, the places they go, who they're, they may befriend one of their friends. And, and some of these serial killers have talked about it a bit like the hunting period is a little bit like foreplay. Um, it is important too to draw this distinction that some of these serial killers will act out sexual rage during the murder, but there are many that are not acting out sexual rage. They're not focusing on genitalia and whatnot, but the pleasure is sadistic in nature. And so they are, they're having a sexual, an internal sexual response even though they may not act that out on the body of the victim. So, so you got to keep in mind what's driving them. And really what's driving them is they like it. They want to hurt somebody. They like hurting them. It, they like the power and control that they possess. So these predatory aggressive personalities, um, they, they recognize, they will voice that they know that they're willing to do things that other people are not willing to do. They're, they're willing to go to places that other people are not willing to do. And it, rather than look at that going, wow, man, I am a really messed up human being. Like there's something wrong with me. They don't feel that at all. They actually feel like a superior creature. It's a delusional state. It's not accurate. But for their own inner workings, they feel like they are the superior creature. And if they are the superior, then what are we? Well, they will tell you that we are inferior. And as such, 
we hadn't got a complaint coming because we're inferior, because we're not willing to do the things that they are willing to do. Well, that justifies the acts of brutality against their victims. It's very frightening that there's people walking around that legitimately feel this way and, and think this way. Um, if you end up in a marriage with one of these people, uh, maybe this person isn't actually a serial killer, but they've de definitely um, can be identified through the dark uh, tetrad. If that's the case, then as long as you're in the marriage and you are giving that person whatever it is that they want, maybe it's the beard of having a family, being a family man like the BTK killer, um, then you have purpose. But if you decide that you're ready to walk, if you decide that you're ready to get out of this unfulfilling and maybe even dangerous marriage, um, then their predatory nature will kick in and they will say, well, they're in, my wife or my husband's inferior to me. If they're not willing to live up to our agreement, our marital agreement, then I have no use for him or her. And so as the superior creature, I'm going to end his life or her life and, and keep my money and keep half my house and keep my things. It's, it's chilling. Um, through the domestic violence research, we know too that the most dangerous time is when you leave one of these relationships. Um, and that's without even considering the possibility of a, of a sadistic spouse. Right. So when we talk about serial killers, we generally think about people like Ted Bundy and, you know, John Wayne Gacy, BTK. Um, they claim that over the course of your lifetime that you will walk past a minimum of 36 people. At some point, you will find yourself face to face with a bona fide killer. Right. Well, I know one that I have been face to face with. I didn't like that at all. I can tell you right now, there's no doubt that he had a creepy energy. You could feel it. It was not right. There was something not right. And it was as innocent, benign of a situation as you could ever imagine like a deacon welcoming you into the church, literally. And something deep inside of me said, ooh, this is uncomfortable. What's wrong with this person? This is not a person that I feel like I need to get close to. This is someone, mm, mm, I, don't, I, I don't even want this person looking in my direction. I don't want to be physically near this person. It was that notable. It's a very, very strange experience. And I actually asked, um, I asked, I asked another creator to, uh, to get, to take my seat to see if she had the same innate kind of response. And she said, oh, he, oh, something's not right. So when that little voice inside of you says, oh, something wrong with this person, you, you better listen and, go, and move away, move away from the creeper because there's it's something, something's not right. Um, so, so Ted Bundy, John Wayne Gacy, these are, these are people that, you know, have been made famous through their atrocities. Um, but there's a lot of other serial killers. There's been, there's been a lot through history um, where, Study of those have provided a peripheral, ha, have provided paths of peripheral, per, peripheral paths of exploration um, for in uh, empirical inquiry, and and so while you may not always be talking about one of the most famous serial killers, they're definitely. Um, there's definitely enough of them out and about that 
you can go into any jail and you can find these people. They're there. It's usually just the more notorious that have something special that stands out. For example, I'm going to say Chris Watts. You go, what are you talking about? He he was he, he killed his family. That's not the same thing as killing multiples of uh, strangers, which is the typical serial killer, you know, idea. But there's a lot of people that have felt like if they go back into Chris Watts history, th there might be, there might be missing people associated with him. People that would have crossed paths with him that for some reason they met some unusual and peculiar end. So we don't know. The people are feeling this about Brian Koberger. They're feeling certain that he would have been involved in other uh, killings or rapes or some type of sadistic crime. So uh, the Federal Bureau of Investigation defines killing as a series of uh, serial killing as a series of two or more murders committed um, in two or uh, in separate locations um, by one offender acting alone, although now they've made the concession that there have been, there's a history of serial killers who have worked in tandem together. There's the, uh, the Barbie doll killers, the really handsome blonde guy and girl in Toronto. That's one example of such a thing. Um, there's other examples of a serial, a notorious serial killer serving out time in jail, being in contact with an active serial killer who's currently killing and going through the motions. So, so they, it does seem like they have, there's a, um, a desire to be able to share their atrocities, like, they're proud of it or they or they it's exciting to them for a long time there was a guy that was coming on youtube um and he was acting out these bizarre little skits almost related to the delphi killing and i've often wondered if it was richard allen so it, since his arrest i'm talking about i wondered if that was his way of trying to reach out and make connection with the people that were talking about his crime while the standard definition is, you know, a series of two or more murders happening in different places by one, maybe more people, um, there's also this specific term serial killer that was first coined to um, that the original serial killer was defined as a perpetrator of who kills three or more people with a very significant cooling off period of at least 30 days between each murder. So it's a that's a bit different, right? It accounts for that calculating and methodical planning as opposed to somebody who's just insane. Remember those two people that were driving around and shooting people, John John Boy Malvoy, something something like that. Um, they're driving through like shopping strip mall shopping centers and just randomly shooting people. I think it was around Washington, D.C. And then they ended up arresting them maybe in Oregon, if my memory serves me. Um, the, you know, they were going about shooting people, but it was it was didn't seem to be planned. It seemed to be rather random. Just I'm going to go do this. And whoever happens to be there is the lucky poor fellow, you know. So, so the original included this idea of a cooling off period of 30 days. So the, the stalking and the planning, the hunting is the, is the foreplay. And then the actual killing is the titillation and the um, apex, the climax. And then there's, and then the, the bloodlust is satiated. The person is feeling calm and so then they have at least 30 days, but there's plenty of serial killers that were, that their cooling off periods were a year or more. 
So, so there's no real, you know, rule of thumb for, you know, what exactly drives them or, or how it's going to be exactly the same, you know, each time. The common belief about who was the first person to coin this term serial killer, they believe was FBI special agent Robert Ressler. He was giving a lecture on criminal profiling in the late 70s, and that was really during the period of time when the profiling thing became such a big deal. Um, Ressler became famous for his work in the field of criminal psychology, and he's considered to be the father of modern behavioral profiling. Um, he's the one that used this term serial killer in a, uh, while he was addressing David Ber Berkowitz. So there are a number of documented uses of the same term dating way back, you know, um, to like uh, 1947, Dorothy Hughes had a mystery book called A Lonely Place, and she identified the antagonist in the book as a serial killer. In that, in that um, specific example, though, I think she was using that as like a, as an adjective and, um, just to, to describe the antagonist, what kind of person that was. I think for wrestler, I think it was a, the motivation was a bit different. He's identifying a type of murder, right? It's a, a serial killer spree. It's a, it's a bit of a different type of murder, almost suggesting that the victim holds absolutely no responsibility, no connection, Nothing that would have alerted them to say, I've attracted the attention of a creeper. So it's kind of the, the, the differences may seem a bit subtle, but they are interesting, you know, differences. Um, they believe that maybe from 1930, uh, there was a German detective who started talking about introducing standards. We saw a little bit of this reflected in, um, the Ghost of Sleepy Hollow with Johnny Depp. Johnny Depp's character, I think he modeled himself a little bit after this German detective, Gennat, um, that he he wasn't just gonna just respond, who, what did you see, who did you see? But he wanted to start the, talking about Johnny Depp's character, that he wanted to take, start taking measurements and looking for standards of behavior and patterns, you know, in, in uh, settings and locations. And so that actually was Gannett um, that, that really started this. And it was about 1930. And it was the, the modern standards that he was trying to create are very similar to what we would consider behavioral profiling today. Um, and so he used this term, you know, serial killer during, during that time. Um, the, uh, the four types of serial killers are identified as, vi I've done a video about this before, as visionary, mission-oriented, hedonistic, and then power or control. And so, uh, visionary believes that they're a separate entity that is commanding them to kill. So there's definitely an element of, of, uh, um, mental illness in terms of seeing things other people don't see, hearing things that other people don't hear. There's real hallucinations happening. Um, there's mission oriented. So the murders are a way to rid society of a particular group of people that is delusional thought in nature and maybe some narcissism. You know, I'm the only one that can clean up this town <laughs> kind of idea. There's hedonistic, that's the, the uh, sadism that was recently added to make the top triad become the dark tetrad, where a person kills for their own personal satisfaction and often is very sexually motivated. Um, and then power and control, where the person craves domination over their victims and then kills the, the victim in order to own the victim. And in most of these, this spe specifically hedonistic and power and control, you've got that sadistic element. That was the element that was getting lost in the research when they were using the triad. And so by adding sadism and breaking it down, 
into its um, into its individual parts and components, then they could pick up on the hedonistic killers and those that were killing out of a drive for power and control. So one of the most famous visionary serial killers of all time was the vampire of Sacramento. See how we even give them kind of like these sexy names? It's really kind of sick and disgusting. Um, that was Richard Chase. He was a deluded psychotic, anything but a novel character. He wasn't a vampire. He was just a mentally ill, homeless, sick guy. We need to be careful, I think. We need to be a little bit more responsible, I think, in not deifying some of these guys, blowing them up into something that's larger than life. The reality is they're just sick, screwed up people. That's the truth. That's a little tangent right there. So the vampire of Sacramento believed that his blood was slowly turning to power. I mean, I'm sorry, powder. And that the only way to replenish it was to consume the blood of others. He was hunting between 1977 and 1978, where he killed 13 people throughout Sacramento, California. Do you think he was a strange child or do you think he was a normal child? He was a strange child. He became an even stranger adult. His obsession with blood began at a very young age. And do you think that there was, um, do you think that there was animal cruelty? Perhaps even mutilation? Something that might make Jeffrey Dahmer proud? Well, actually, now that you mention it, yes. In fact, young Chase devoured animals when he was a small child. He would butcher them and then he would consume their raw entrails. As an adult, Chase was discovered in a variety of very bizarre situations, including being discovered naked in the field covered in cow's blood. So you see people, all those dead cows, farm animals, it was not alien. It was just a sick and demented poor Richard Chase. It's very sad when you really, the, the authors take these guys and they turn them into these kind of like uh, special people. And they're not, they're, it's sad and it is gross, inhuman. They're mentally ill. They're doing things that are monstrous, and we really have to stop the the uh, the drive to sort of you know make immortalize them in in uh, fictional narrative. We have to we have to quit doing that. It's not it's not okay. So Richard Chase um, began to believe that the bones that were in his skull were falling apart. He would inject himself with rabbit's blood in order to keep his blood supply topped off. He was eventually, what do you mean eventually? Well, well, this was around the 80s. It's when people got a little weird and said, no, we shouldn't keep mentally ill people in hospitals. What, I'm not talking about mentally ill, like I've got a you know major depressive disorder or I have anxiety. I'm talking about people who believe that their blood is turning to powder and they're, they're eating small animals raw. These are people that need help. They need, they need the support of medication that they get regularly. They need to be protected so they don't harm themselves or others. There's a place for, you know, a hospital, hospital care, um, but instead, we kind of turned these people out in the out in the streets, the bus stations, you know, and it was not a good idea. Um, so, in 1977, Chase entered the realm of murder, stabbing, and shooting victims. He wasn't concerned with their age, race, or gender. There was no standard. He didn't look for all blondes, for example. 
Um, in some of these instances, he drank the blood of his victims. When Chase was discovered, they found jars of his favorite drink in the apartment, as well as the stained clothing when he was killing them. Chase was arrested. He was charged with six counts of murder, and he was eventually sentenced to death. He died in the in his prison cell on Boxing Day, 1980, Christmas, of an overdose. I don't know. Was that accidental? You tell me. Um, what are some examples? So that was the visionary. So what are some examples of the mission-oriented serial killer? Well, the Yorkshire Ripper. See how we do that? See how we give them these names? And we shouldn't do that. The Yorkshire Ripper, perfect example of mission-oriented serial killer. Peter Sutcliffe. And we do have a YouTuber that was going by this name for a while. Uh, Peter Sutcliffe was once belittled by a streetwalker, a prostitute. And so between 1975 and 80, he attacked and killed a total of 13 sex workers and attempted to murder seven others between 1975 and 80 throughout the north of England. Like many other mission-oriented killers, Sutcliffe targeted a particular race, a certain age range, and gender. His intended part target was white, young, female. Because it was, in fact, a white, young, female prostitute, that had made fun of him. He kept, he, he hunted in a very small, limited geographical region, and he kept his MO consistent throughout his entire killing spree, and that was a blitz attack with a hammer. Upon his capture, Sutcliffe famously said, what are you doing with me? I'm just cleaning up these streets. You thought that was Poncho, didn't you, that said that? Yeah, not Poncho. Okay. All right. What are some examples of hedonistic serial killer? The hedonistic serial killer is actually a very broad category that can be broken down into three subcategories. That is lust, thrill, and comfort. Lust uh, killers kill for their own sexual gratification, and there's usually... Uh, sexual assault on the body of the victim. Again, remember, a lot of these, they may not target, they, there may not be, they may not commit sexual acts, sexual violence um, against the body of the victim, but they're ha definitely having a sexual drive and satisfaction from it. Um, the thrill, the thrill killer kills for the adrenaline rush um, they get scared, they get pumped up and frightened, and, and they like that drive and that power and that energy that comes from it. Um, the comfort killer, what's the most famous one that we know of on the streets of YouTube? Chris Watts. Yeah. Maybe some others. I could, I'm, it's possible I could name some others too. Um, but the comfort killer is killing for financial or material reasons. Now, there's some of you that are going to say, I'm completely wrong about that. And I can accept that. We can have a conversation about that. But I can't, I can't get out of my head two things related to Chris Watts. I can't get out that the day that he killed them and put them in those tanks, his babies, he was shopping for Audis and he was a, he was a car guy. So I can't get that out of my head. The only thing that would have been better, you know, or worse would have been if, if he was shopping for a sh new Shelby, that would have really secured it. But with the Audi, I wonder, was that going to be like a gift for his girlfriend or, you know, I don't know, but it was still, odd. it was an odd thing to do after you've just done something that would bring a normal human being to their knees um, and he goes on and is shopping for Audis and he's listened to Metallica, you know, strange choice of songs there, Chris, but it is what it is. Um, 
So he benefited, he would have benefit from the deaths of the two girls and his wife. They, we, it, later on, we came to learn that they had some pretty substantial um, life insurance policies on them. Remember? So I think Mr. Watts could definitely be called a comfort killer. He benefited financially from the death. So did uh, Lori Vallow, Chad Daybell. I'm there. I'm willing to call them serial killers and I'm willing to call them comfort killers. And I think there was more too. <laughs> I think they definitely believed that they were special and, you know, they were doing the, you know, they were securing their power over, you know, they were going to be king and queen of 144,000. What do you make of that? Right. So um, Edmund um, Kemper is a example of a lust killer. Between 1972 and 1973, Kemper picked up a total of six female hitchhikers around Santa Cruz, California. Kemper picked up, a, oops, sorry, wrong sentence, um, Santa Cruz, California, and he attacked, strangled, and then dismembered them. Each of these kills Kemper describes as sexual relief. Not, for, not just the act of killing, but there was also post-mortem action. He is noted for being six feet, nine inches tall with an IQ of approximately 140. Most of his murders included necrophilia. It, this is a sick puppy, truly. California's most famous unidentified serial killer, though now he's definitely identified, is the Zodiac. He's the perfect example of a hedonistic thrill kill. The Zodiac reveled in the adrenaline rush he received from terrorizing the streets of San Francisco throughout the 1970s. Not only did the Zodiac murder a couple in lovers' lanes throughout the city, but also taunted press and police with via letters. That see, a lot of this is a lot of this is the intellect, right? They're messed up, they're screwed up for probably from childhood things happening, or perhaps they're just. Uh, their neurological system is um, something's off and they're not getting stimulated like a normal person does. They feel numb. They feel detached. But when they engage in these types of activities, then they get, um, finally, they can feel the change in the emotions and the bodily sensations. And they like that. And it gets messed up. But when they, they I, I think there's many more of these people doing this, but they're dumb like Koberger, <laughs> right? They're dumb. And so they don't get, they don't, they don't have, they, they're not able to elude the police long enough to establish their notorious pattern of behavior. They do one, two, three times, and then they're caught. Well, they're not a serial killer. They're just a prisoner, <laughs> right? There's no, nobody writes books about them because they were stupid. They got caught. The ones that get books written about, written about them, though, are those that have that high IQ and they're able to elude capture or, or detection for a long period of time. Um, you look at Richard Allen. I find it fascinating that he didn't bolt. He didn't leave town. He continued doing what he did. And are we willing to say that not a single person in Delphi or that immediate area not a single one of them ever looked at the pharmacist, pharmacist and said, gosh, something about the way that guy walks. I just don't believe that. I think someone at some point must have felt, you know, it's terrible to say, but I think that guy looks a lot like that video. So I don't know. But, but anyway, maybe Richard Allen's very intelligent. Maybe we're going to find out that he's rocking 145, 148 IQ, you know, maybe so. Uh, the power or control serial killer, um, these are probably the most prolific serial killers, um, according to the FBI. Ted Bundy is considered the archetype of the power serial killer. He craved domination. He wanted to dominate his victims. He loved the manipulation. He loved the game. He, the attacks on them were as brutal and as indulgent 
as anyone could imagine. He included sexual assault upon their bodies. And then he really enjoyed that feeling of discarding them as if they were so unimportant, their lives had had no significance, and that he was so special and they were so insignificant that he would just throw them on the side of the road and be finished with them. Uh, remember what I said, the FBI thinks that the power of control serial killers are the most prolific killers that that manage to elude um, police or detection. And so there's a lot of them that we know their names. John Wayne Gacy is one of them. BTK, who is Dennis Rader, Gary Ridgway, um, Andre Chacatillo, James D'Angelo, who's been caught. Um so, you know, when you go down that list, you tend to believe what the FBI's put together. You can definitely see that we know a lot of them, right? We know a lot of their names. So the power or control types, they are the most common form of serial killer. Um, they, it, it's interesting to me, some of these guys, maybe all of them, I just haven't looked at them. But a lot of these guys, when you, the power of control killers, when you go back and you look at the way that they were living um, as they were acting out the, the, these horrible crimes, um, they were living lives where they really didn't have much control. They were living lives where maybe they were being belittled by a spouse or they had no money or they had jobs that made them feel as if they were invisible. So it's, it's very interesting that these men have chosen to act out their control during periods of time when they really actually have very little actual control. Um, they have the power control killers harbor feelings of inadequacy. But again, if you look at their lifestyles, they kind of are inadequate. Um, they often have experienced very violent childhood experience that they were the victims of other violent men or women. Um, the power and control killers often engage not only in the, in the uh, torture before death, but there's a lot of postmortem manipulation. So they continue acting on the body, which the, the researchers at the FBI believe that that's further uh, dehumanization. That's the ultimate in control, Te treating their bodies as if um, they were little more than an animal. You know, it, it's just part of the devaluing and dehumanization. Uh, many of these power and control killers, they like it. They like it. They're like, yeah, I'm tough. And so they don't want to leave that behind. I mean, they think about this. So they're enjoying the, the sadistic nature, the torture beforehand. They're liking it so much that they extend it into the post-mortem period to, to draw it out because it's so exquisite to them. So what do you think? Do you think these are the guys that take the souvenirs? They do. So the, so the power and control types are the ones most likely to take a souvenir um, because it helps form that connection to such an exquisite experience for them. The experience is now over. They drug it out as long as they could. They take a souvenir with them. And then when they're at home or going about their work day, they can take that souvenir out and go, oh, that was a good, that was a good one. Um, kind of like, you know, when I went to Disney World, I bought a hoodie or I bought a Linux figurine and you put that out and you look at it and it makes you, it kind of gives you, a, there's a memory of the sensation, the feeling of being there and it's nice. Um, so it's, it's, it's when you really kind of get down in the trenches and you really try to understand the motivations of these people, it's so hard to accept, but you have to remember these people, John Wayne Gacy, you know, David Parker Ray, Gary Ridgway, they're not us. They are absolutely not us. Ted Bundy, Jeffrey Dahmer, child, uh, 
their periods of developmental growth through childhood was um, humiliating and demeaning. And in some cases, violent. So they're not like us. We don't have any way of make, uh, setting a parallel to them to understand what was making them tick. We can't. All we can do is listen to their words and believe what they say because we don't have that ability to form that connection with them. Um, yes, these serial killers will quite very often overlap. Um, we already talked about some of the, the uh, hedonistic, I think definitely without a doubt, hedonistic is often overlapped with the power and the control serial killer. Um, so almost all serial killers will fit into one or a combination of the four categories. Um, there are a handful of these serial killers that seem to have no motive at all, but I'd still, I'd still say, even if they don't seem to have some kind of motive, there is something, there is something driving it. Otherwise they would have keep doing it. Remember, as a behaviorist, you have to believe that a person that's engaging in a behavior, they're doing it because somehow it's working for them. Doesn't mean it's healthy, but it's giving them something that is rewarding or re I guess I should use the term reinforcing being that, well, if I do this, if I get that, that's going to increase the likelihood of me repeating this behavior again is the definition. So if you got someone killing people and you don't know why they're killing them, but they keep doing it, you need to sit back and relax and try to look at the behavior. Something is working Something that they're doing is enjoyable or functional. And each time they do it, it is increasing the likelihood that they will do it again in the future. Um, in 2007, there were two teenage killers from Russia. No, they were not called Vladimir, but that, you know, you get that. Um, two teenage killers from Russia dubbed uh, Neprop. I practiced this. Now I can't remember. Nepropotrop. Nepropotrop. maniacs killed a total of 21 people in a single month. One of the murders, they had, saw two boys um, and they bludgeoned them with a hammer. It was filmed and uploaded to the internet in 2008. No motive. Nobody knows, have any idea why they did it. The fact that they uploaded it to the internet might be your first clue. This may be, we may need a new category of serial killers. People driven to be Instagram famous. The social media killers. I'll do anything to have a presence on social media, for people to know me, know my name, my face. I'll do anything. Sky's the limit. You want me to hang off upside down off a cliff? I'll do that as long as it makes me famous on the internet. So we may need to think of a new um, category of serial killers. Uh, British serial killer Robert Maud Maudsley, who is Hannibal the Cannibal, um, because he slept in an underground glass cell that was very similar to the cell that the Silence of the Lambs had for Hannibal Lecter. Um, he too seemed to have no motive at all for the two murders that he committed. In 1974, Maudsley killed a sex worker in London, um, then handed himself into the authorities. Well, I would argue just a little bit because this is kind of, um, isn't it just a little bit like the visionary or the mission oriented? It might be a little bit like the mission oriented where the murders are being completed in order to rid society of, you know, some bad thing that that person is there to help all the rest of us. 
And if that means serial killing, then so be it. They're willing to, they're willing to make that sacrifice in order to make the streets a safer place. So I don't know if I would say Maudsley didn't really have a motive. Maybe he did. Maybe we just didn't dig far enough. All right. I would, if, when I say dig far enough, I'm talking about how, how mentally ill was this guy? Were there delusions? What, uh, was he having any kind of uh, hallucinations? You know, what, what was he doing? Um, all right. How am I on time is what I want to know. I am 51 minutes. Ooh, definitely ran longer than I wanted to. So which country has the most serial killers? You know the answer. That's right. God bless America. The good old United States of America. Between 1900 and 2016, United States has had at least 3,204 serial killers that we know about. The, um, next to the United States of America is South Africa, which has endured 167 serial killers and it, from, from uh, 1900 to 2016. And so it means that the United States of America, we're not just breeders of serial killers. We're great breeders of serial killers. We have 19 times more serial killers than the next country on the list, which is South Africa. All right. Nothing to be proud of, right? But we do have some good music in the United States. So I know it makes you guys a little nervous when I kind of, you know, make some jokes. But you know what? Sometimes people make jokes when they get nervous. Sometimes people make jokes when they're having a conversation about a difficult topic to try to relieve the stress in the room. And can we at least agree on one thing? Today's topic, it was a little disturbing 